Greetings and welcome to the UniFirst Corp. fourth quarter earnings conference call. During the presentation, all participants will be in a listen-only mode. Later, we will conduct a question and answer session. At that time, if you have a question, please press the 1, followed by the 4 on your telephone. If at any time during the conference you need to reach the operator, please press star 0. It is now my pleasure to turn the conference over to Stephen Sintros, President and Chief Executive Officer. Please go ahead. Thank you and good morning. I'm Stephen Sintros, Unifor's President and Chief Executive Officer. Joining me today is Shane O'Connor, Executive Vice President and Chief Financial Officer. I'd like to welcome you to Unifor's Corporation's conference call to review our fourth quarter results for fiscal year 2022. This call will be on a listen-only mode until we complete our prepared remarks, but first, a brief disclaimer. This conference call may contain forward-looking statements that reflect the company's current views with respect to future events and financial performance. These forward-looking statements are subject to certain risks and uncertainties. The words anticipate, optimistic, believe, estimate, expect, intend, and similar expressions that indicate future events and trends identify forward-looking statements. Actual future results may differ materially from those anticipated depending on a variety of risk factors. For more information, please refer to the discussion of these risk factors in our most recent 10-K and 10-Q filings with the Securities and Exchange Commission. We are very excited to be announcing today that we have officially reached another major milestone as a company as we reported just over $2 billion in annual revenues for our fiscal 2022. Unifirst has come a long way from our humble beginnings back in 1936, operating out of a single location in Boston, Massachusetts, and we, are very, we continue to be very excited about our future. I want to thank our thousands of team partners who, in the face of a challenging operating environment, continue to always deliver for each other and our customers. They are the engine that makes Unifirst go, and they deserve all the credit for our ability to be celebrating this milestone today. During the quarter, as always, our team focused on providing industry-leading service to our customers, as well as selling prospective customers on the value that Unifirst can bring to their businesses. Our fourth quarter results reflect a strong top-line performance that allowed us to hit that $2 billion mark, with consolidated revenues growing 11%. We are pleased with the execution of our team, which delivered solid performances in both new account sales as well as customer retention in fiscal 22. Continuing the trend from prior quarters, the strong revenue growth also reflects the impact of price adjustments from throughout the year as we continue to work with our customers to share in cost increases related to the inflationary environment. As we discussed in prior calls, we continue to be focused on three large initiatives designed to transform the company in terms of our overall com capabilities and competitive positioning. These initiatives are the rollout of our new CRM system, a corporate-wide ERP system, and investments in the Unifirst brand. As we have talked about over the last few years, we continue to be focused on making good investments in our people, our infrastructure, and our technologies. With respect to our CRM systems project, we are making good progress deploying our new system in line with our internal schedule. As of our fiscal year end, over 50% of our U.S. laundry locations have been deployed, and we expect the remaining U.S. locations to be deployed by the end of fiscal 23. The deployment of our smaller Canadian and clean room operations will carry into fiscal 24. During fiscal 23, we will also be focused on the global design phase of our ERP initiative. Our new Oracle Cloud ERP system project will be a multi-year initiative designed to transform our supply chain and procurement capabilities, as well as provide an overall technology foundation for growth and efficiency. And finally, as we discussed on prior earnings calls, during fiscal 22, we officially launched our new brand through a series of national TV ads featuring real Unifirst customers and employees. Our message focuses on serving people who always deliver for their companies, their customers, and their families. At Unifirst, our ongoing focus will be to always deliver for them. Although some costs related to this brand transformation will extend into fiscal 23, the larger one-time expenditures are mostly behind us. All of our investments are designed to deliver solid long-term returns for Unifirst stakeholders and are integral components of our primary long-term objective to be universally recognized as the best service provider in our industry. We continue to report results adjusted for the direct impact of these costs related to these investments. Similar to our message last quarter, our adjusted profitability 
continues to be challenged by the broad impact that the inflationary environment is having on many of our costs, as well as the challenging labor environment. The largest item impacting our margins compared to the prior year is higher merchandise amortization that is being influenced both by the inflationary effect on the cost of our products, as well as higher levels of merchandise being put in service with our customers. These higher levels are partially being driven by a number of growth-related factors, including a pickup in activity in our energy-dependent markets, solid new account sales, elevated wearer additions at our customers, as well as certain national account investments. As we look ahead into fiscal 23, we'll be watching the dynamic market environment closely. Although there have been some signs that the higher interest rate environment will slow overall economic demand and hopefully moderate costs, we have yet to see any significant change in our business. As a result, we are not assuming any change to the current economic conditions in our forecast. Shane will provide further details shortly, but in summary, our outlook for fiscal 23 reflects solid continued momentum on the top line and a similar operating margin as fiscal 22. Despite the challenges in the overall operating environment, we continue to manage through these obstacles and execute against our plan. We will continue to manage costs in areas we can control while assuring we don't impact the ability to execute on our transformational initiatives or adversely affect our customer service levels. As always, we maintain a sharp focus on taking care of our employees, our customers, and bringing new customers to the Unifirst family. And while we are confident that we will ultimately be able to improve our operating margins, back to more historical levels and beyond, we also firmly believe that building a stronger company for the future will take a certain level of time and investment. And with that, I would like to turn the call over to Shane, who will provide the details of our results for the fourth quarter and our outlook for fiscal 2023. Thanks, Steve. Consolidated revenues in our fourth quarter of 2022 were $516.4 million an increase of 11% from $465.3 million a year ago. And consolidated operating income decreased to $33.3 million from $44.9 million, or 26%. Net income for the quarter decreased to $26.2 million, or $1.39 per diluted share, from $34.6 million, or $1.82 per diluted share. Our financial results in the fourth quarter of fiscal 2022 included $9.1 million of costs directly attributable to our three key initiatives that Steve discussed. Excluding these initiative costs, adjusted operating income was $42.3 million, adjusted net income was $33.7 million, and adjusted diluted earnings per share was $1.79. Although our financial results in the prior year may have included direct costs related to these key initiatives, the company did not specifically track the amounts that were being expensed. This was because the amount was less significant in value and a number of costs were still being capitalized. As a result, similar to previous quarters this fiscal year, we will not be providing adjusted amounts for the prior year comparable periods. Our core laundry operations revenues for the quarter were $458.6 million, an increase of 10.5% from the fourth quarter of 2021. Core laundry organic growth, which adjusts for the estimated effect of acquisitions, as well as fluctuations in the Canadian dollar, was 9.9%. Our organic growth rates continue to benefit from solid sales performance and improved customer retention in fiscal 2022, as well as efforts to share with our customers the inflationary cost increases that we have been experiencing in our business. Court laundry operating margin decreased to 6.3% for the quarter, or $29 million, from 10.1% in prior year, or $41.8 million. The costs we incurred during the quarter related to our key initiatives were recorded to the core laundry operations segment, and excluding these costs, the segment's adjusted operating margin was 8.3%. As Steve discussed, merchandise amortization continues to be the most significant item impacting our adjusted operating margin in the quarter. In addition, our operating results were also impacted by higher energy costs as a percentage of revenues as well as increased input and labor costs due to the current inflationary environment. 
These cost increases were partially offset by lower health care and payroll-related costs as a percentage of revenues. Energy costs increased to 5.3% of revenues in the fourth quarter of 2022, up from 4.2% a year ago. Revenues from our specialty garments segment, which delivers specialized nuclear decontamination and clean room products and services, were $36.7 million for the fourth quarter of fiscal 2022, an increase of 8.3% over 2021. Segment's top line growth was primarily driven by its clean room operations. Segment's operating income during the quarter was $4 million, relatively consistent with prior year. As we've mentioned in the past, this segment's results can vary significantly from period to period due to seasonality as well as the timing and profitability of nuclear reactor outages and pro projects. Our first aid segment's revenues in the fourth quarter of 2022 increased to $21.2 million from $16.3 million, with, the book, with both the wholesale and van operations contributing to this growth. However, the segment's operating income was nominal during the quarter due to our continued investment in the segment's van business. We continue to maintain a solid balance sheet and financial position with no long-term debt and cash, cash equivalents, and short-term investments totaling $376.4 million at the end of fiscal 2022. Cash provided by operating activities for the year was $122.6 million, a decrease of $89.7 million from the prior year. This decrease was primarily due to reduced profitability, including the impact of our key initiative costs, as well as heavier than normal working capital liens of the business. In fiscal 2022, we continue to invest in our future, with capital expenditures totaling $144.3 million and the acquisition of 13 businesses for which we paid a total of $44.2 million. During the fourth quarter of fiscal 2022, we repurchased 47,775 shares of common stock for $8 million under our previously announced stock repurchase program, and also repurchased 35,714 shares of Class B common stock for $6 million in a privately negotiated transaction. I'd like to take this opportunity to provide our outlook for fiscal 2023. At this time, we anticipate our full year revenues will be between $2.145 billion and $2.16 billion. This top line guidance assumes core laundry revenue growth at the midpoint of the range is 7.7% and organic growth to be 8.3%. For fiscal 2023, we further expect that our diluted earnings per share will be between $5.50 and $5.90. This guidance includes $40 million of costs that we expect to incur in the fiscal year directly attributable to our three key initiatives. Excluding these transitionary investment costs, our core laundry operations adjusted operating margin assumption at the midpoint of the range is 8.1%. This adjusted operating margin reflects continued pressure from the current inflationary environment higher levels of merchandise amortization, elevated energy costs, indirect costs we are incurring related to our key initiatives, as well as additional investments we are making in strengthening our overall capabilities. Based on the current energy prices, we are modeling that energy costs will be 4.7% of revenues in fiscal 2023, compared to 4.9% in 2022. Next year's effective tax rate is assumed to be 25%. Our specialty garments revenues are forecast to be relatively flat compared to 2022. However, the segment's operating income is expected to be down approximately 5%, primarily due to the timing and relative profitability of its planned outages and project work. Our first aid segment's revenues are expected to be up approximately 18%, compared to 2022. However, this segment's profitability is once again expected to be relatively marginal in 2023 as a result of the investments we continue to make in building out the infrastructure 
to support a national geographic footprint for our van operations. We expect that our capital expenditures in 2023 will approximate $140 million, and our guidance assumes our current level of outstanding common shares and no deterioration in the current economic environment. This concludes our prepared remarks, and we would now be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you. If you would like to register a question or comment, please press the one followed by the four on your telephone. You will hear a three-tone prompt to acknowledge your request. If your question has been answered and you would like to withdraw your registration, please press the one followed by the three. One moment, please. The first question comes from Andrew Steinerman of J.P. Morgan. Please go. Hi. Good morning. It's Andrew. I, good morning. I have two, two, two questions. One, would you be willing to quantify for us the merchandise amortization uh, drag in the fourth quarter and assumed in 23? And, and then I have a, a second question. Um, you were very good at going over the key initiatives and, you know, what's driving um, – uh, fiscal year 23 spend. Could you just tell us how much um, a spend there should be in meaning in terms of investments in the key initiatives past 23? So let, let me let me start with the key initiatives and then I'll turn the merchandise over to Shane. Um, from a key initiative standpoint, as I talked about, um, you know, about two thirds of the key initiative cost this year will be related to completing or mostly completing our CRM systems rollout. A lot of that will fall off as we get into 24. The other large chunk of 23 initiative cost is related to ERP system. As we get to 24, uh, the ERP system will transition more from the design phase into a, a build and implementation phase where uh, more costs will likely be capitalized in 24 than 23. Um, so I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit, but there'll probably be some less uh, direct cost, uh, initiative costs that are growing through the P&L in 2024 than 23. So we do, we do expect, in short, for 23 to be the high watermark of initiative costs going through the P&L, although in 24 and, and 25, as we continue to work through our, C, uh, excuse me, our ERP, there will be higher levels of capitalization related to that initiative. Hopefully mm -hmm. that sort of makes yep. sense, Andrew. Yep, sure. And I'll turn it to Shane on the uh, on the merchandise. Yep. Uh, so as it relates to the merchandise drag for both the fourth quarter as well as as we look into 2023, <clears throat> um, yeah, when I take a look at the fourth quarter, carving out the actual amount related to merchandise amortization, I don't think it's as meaningful when I compare prior year, just because of some of the disruption that we were still incurring at that point in time. What I will say is that, as you can see from my comments, my energy drag during that quarter was about 110 basis points, and my merchandise amortization um, headwind exceeded that, right? So it was a significant uh, As we look into next year, um, my merchandise amortization is the largest headwind that we're seeing, and the expected uh, headwind there is about a point to our margin. Uh, again, a lot of the things that Steve had articulated in his in his uh, prepared comments are continuing to impact our merchandise amortization. And as that ramps throughout the year, um, yeah, it's carrying into 2023. Okay, a couple you. other quick comments. Quick comments there, uh, Andrew, on the merchandise. As Shane talked about, uh, it's really being impacted, and I said it in my prepared remarks, it's a combination of higher cost of merchandise and more being placed in service, as well as some of the older tranches related to the pandemic time uh, that are dropping off that represented much lower merchandise being placed in service, particularly for some of our longer life garments uh, in the FR, flame resistant area that last 24 months. So you're just still having some of that natural build going on during 23. Right. And if you don't mind, I'm just, Steve, I'm just guess one quick follow-up. And when sure. you think about 24, the CRM system being in place for all of uh, U.S. laundry by the end of 23, just uh, talk about the benefits that you expect from the new CRM system as, as we, you know, go a year out. 
Yeah, I think one of the things we've always talked about, and it actually ties back to merchandise, is, is continued improvement of merchandise controls. Obviously, we're, we're, we're already starting to see some of the benefit. Uh, maybe it's a little more intangible on our team, shorter hours for the route drivers, um, you know, more ability to, to provide automation and transparency to the customers. So the, the route efficiency of the route day has, has improved quite a bit as we deploy. Now, some of that's being offset that there's a lot of learning and change going on going from our old system. But we expect that to, to, to really help once they have sort of, in many cases, a full year of the new system under their belt and, and really start taking advantage of the benefits. Okay. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. The next question comes from Andy Widman of Baird. Please go ahead. Yeah, great. Good morning, guys. Um, I guess I wanted to uh, talk about um, cash flow a little bit here, um, a couple things. Could you uh, just talk about um, the, the reasons behind the working capital investment uh, this past year in 22 being higher than normal? And if you expect in uh, 23, if you could just give us kind of the net of what you're expecting, what, maybe a range on free cash flow. You gave us kind of the components here, but may, maybe there's a working capital uh, drawdown that you'll be able to pick up next year. So I wanted to just get your sense of what a reasonable uh, range of, of, of free cash flow for 23 might be. Yeah. Yeah, so as we look into 2023, uh, our expectations clearly in 2023, 22, we had a significant amount of working capital needs for the business. And when you take a look at those, those relate to, um, I guess, first and foremost, our merchandise and service. We've been talking about our merchandise amortization ramping. And as we put more products into service, you can see the adjustment and the investment uh, reflected on our balance sheet. Um, during 2023, uh, our expectation around that is that it will be more normalized uh, and less significant than it was in, in 2022. Uh, we also have elevated accounts receivable balances, um, and some of that relates to the deployment of our system as we continue to work through uh, some of that change management, et cetera. Um, and then there were one of the things that I had mentioned last quarter was we had deferred some um, FICA payments. Um, under some of the stimulus related to the pandemic that um, we had to pay back last year. Um, so again, our expectations coming into 2023 is that there's going to be um, significantly less working capital needs uh, of the business compared to 2022. Um, not necessarily forecasting that there's going to be a drawdown, which is going to result in a, in a, a cash infusion. Um, but when we take a look at our expectations around free cash flow, it's probably around $75 million, right? And that's obviously still being impacted by the investment in our initiatives and, and our current profitability, as well as the elevated capital expenditures that we're expecting um, as we advance some of these initiatives. And, and, and there's another FICA payment coming here in the next couple of months too, Shane? Uh, the second the second half of that payment is expected in in December of this year. Yes. And how much was that again? Uh, it's a little over twelve million dollars. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and then maybe Steve, as my follow up, um, can you talk about um, price cost dynamics? Um, uh, uh, when do you feel like um, you're going to be able to get on the right side is the guidance for the year that you gave here for like the core margin, the core laundry segment margins. Is that kind of down a little bit in the front half of the year? And then you think in the second half of the year that margins can start uh, comping positively. Um, I, I guess I'd like to hear a little bit more about that and any initiatives that you've got going on price, whether it's fuel surcharges or anything like that would just be helpful context for, I think for us all to know. Yeah, I think what you said about the trajectory of the uh, of the margin during the year um, is somewhat embedded into our our forecast. Um, I think when you look at the environment, um, again, you know we're we're forecasting sort of current current status quo, and I think you know I, I sort of made this comment in my prepared remarks. You're seeing some signs that that certain things may be reducing, certain freight costs, certain 
even some raw material costs potentially. Now, some of those may not take hold till later in the year. You think about supply chain, buying fabric and things like that. There's sort of a long, long cycle of that before you start to see it in your merchandise amortization. But we're hopeful that, that some of that stuff starts to take hold, you know, later in the year and you start to see some, some turnaround there. And from, from a price environment perspective, I mean, I think we continue to, 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 to do multiple things. You talked about fuel surcharges to try to stay on top of, uh, the situation, and we'll, and we'll continue to do that. I think our customers have, have worked with us well through through the environment, and and it's uh, it's just an ongoing uh, ongoing effort as 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 we work through the dynamic environment. Right? You talk about fuel; it it goes down, it goes up. We're we're really trying just to evaluate uh, what makes sense as we go forward, and and we build that strategy for twenty for twenty three. Yeah, Andy, Andy, the only thing that I would add to that is back to your margin uh, question as it relates to the quarters. Um, we've mentioned this before that um, the profitability of our quarters has some seasonality to it, um, with oftentimes our first quarter being more profitable and our second quarter being, um, you know, our least profitable. Again, back to Steve's comment about the trajectory, I would say that that trajectory is the quarterly comparisons to the, to the comparable prior year period, um, meaning the, uh, the, I guess the momentum or the, the improvement that we're seeing is really the, the delta between the, the current uh, or any individual quarter and uh, the prior year comparable, if that makes sense. Right. You're basically saying the year-over-year margin change will be potentially more negative in the earlier quarters and then hopefully turn more positive um, in the in the second half of the year. I think that's, that's, that's exactly kind of right. what you, we're just trying to say. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Exactly. All right. Uh, I think I'll, I'm glad you were able, I'm glad you were able to get it. <laughs> <laughs> I'll leave, um, I'll leave it there, guys. Have a good day. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. The next question comes from Jack Boyle, North Coast. Please go. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you for taking my questions. Um, just sure. real quick, uh, I have a question here, and you guys are great on answering uh, uh, some of the uh, seasonal cadence here. Just have a question about um, stabilizing the margins. Is there, you know, in, in terms of continuing to grow the revenue, do you guys believe that is, is there any time of type of um, minimal revenue growth that you guys believe that you would need to attain to, or continue attaining to stabilize the margins or, or improve them? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, we've obviously been through a period of higher growth here over the last year or so um, tied to the inflationary environment, but, but you're right. Um, you have to continue to keep that top line momentum, say, beyond the period that, that you know, the higher inflation takes hold. Let's say things slow down a bit and uh, we're back to more of a normal operating environment, um, yeah, we still have to be pushing growth toward the mid-single digits to uh, to get those margins to recover, right? You're not going to really be able to do a low single digits growth and, uh, and improve the margins. The one thing I will say is that, you know, there are a number of sort of uh, counter-cyclical influences of our costs when the business does slow down. Like some of the things we're talking about with fuel, if we went into, uh, you know, somewhat of a slowdown, and, and you have to be careful because no one wants a deep recession, right? But obviously what's going on now is trying to cool the econ economy appropriately, I guess. And, and sometimes that can help our costs because I talked about merchandise being placed in service. When you think about how we put merchandise in service with our customers, the more our customers are adding employees, the more garments we're putting in service, and there's sort of an upfront cost associated with that. The more turnover there is amongst uh, our customers' employees, uh, which a lot of companies are experiencing elevated turnover in this environment, uh, there's more merchandise placed in service. So, um, yeah, that being said, to, your, to, to answer your, your real question, you do need to maintain some healthy growth to, to continue to move the margins in the right direction. And uh, as we move past the, the true inflationary period, it'll be back to that core of, uh, of selling retention and, uh, and making sure we're getting appropriate pricing along the way. Very good. And, and just as a quick follow-up to your merchandise comment there, are you guys seeing any kind of uh, elongation in how long you're having to store that merchandise? Is there any 
um, change in the length of the sales process? I would say no. I think we continue to work on uh, utilizing our used garments, which is a key part of, of, uh, of improving our profitability. And, and quite frankly, as we move into our ERP systems project, one of the key areas of focus is improved utilization of used inventory across our location. So, but no, I wouldn't say we're seeing a significant change there. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. As a reminder via the phone lines, you may press the 1 followed by the 4 on your telephone keypad to register a question or comment. And the next question comes from Tim Mulrooney, William Blair. Please go ahead. Yeah, uh, good morning, Shane, Steve. Um, morning. Uh, two quick questions from me. Thanks. Yeah, can you talk about trends in new customer account growth? I'm, you know, I'm assuming that ad stops with customers is, is still okay given that unemployment you know remains so low but I'm thinking maybe where you'd start to see signs of macro weakness first uh, might be with um, new customer leads so if you could just comment on you know how that's trended over the last quarter yeah no I would say new customer wins uh, continues to be to be to be very solid I mean for the full year we sold more new business than we did in fiscal 21 um, and I think that trend was reasonably consistent uh, over the over the back half of the year. So I wouldn't say we're seeing a slowdown there. Um, in a typical environment where we where we do start to see economic slowdown, it really does show up typically in the wearers first. Now this environment might be a little different, right? And this is sort of the the dynamic where uh, people are expecting a slowdown with the higher interest rates, but hiring is still pretty good, unemployment still very low. So so you're right. We have not seen that real slowdown or pullback in wearer levels. Uh, that is our, our normal indicator that, that the slowdown is coming. But obviously we're keeping a, a sharp eye open for it and uh, is something that I'm, I'm sure will be a, a factor uh, eventually during the year um, one way or another. Right. No, that's helpful. So the way I should think about it normally is you actually do see it in that ad stop first, but given this type of environment, it might be different this time around. So maybe I'll, yeah, I'll it, ask you about it again next quarter. Yep, absolutely. When you think about the last 15 years, the recession 2008, 2009, we certainly saw it in the wearers first. I would say the other time we saw wearers pull back was when energy sort of tanked in 2015, 16, after the you know many years of an energy boom, we saw some wear pull back pretty quickly. So yeah, it's usually our leading indicator. That's that's great, thank you. And um, just as my follow up, I wanted to ask about just if labor availability you know has eased at all in recent months. We we've heard from some folks that the labor environment's gotten a touch better, uh, while others say it's it was just as difficult as it's ever been um, all year. So curious to hear your thoughts as it relates to, you know, maybe both your route drivers and, and your production plant workers. Thank you. Yeah, you know, great question. And I think, you, you know, I, I'd say our experience is, is very consistent with, you know, what I've been sort of, uh, you know, reading in the broader economy, which is we are seeing more applicants. Um, and so we are better staffed today than we were six, nine months ago. There's no question. Uh, on both the route driver and the production side, I will say turnover is is not you know was not really better in the fourth quarter though. Turnover continues to be high, but we we continue to or, or we're we're seeing improvement in the ability to fill those positions and find applicants. So I think you're you're it seems very consistent with what I'm seeing from other companies. There's a little little bit of an improvement in the ability to find people. Okay, that's very helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That was our final phone question. I'll turn the call back over for any closing remarks. Yeah, I'd like to thank everyone for joining us today uh, for our fourth quarter results, and we look forward to speaking with you again in January when we expect to be reporting our first quarter uh, performance. Thank you all, and have a great day. Thank you. This does conclude the conference call for today. We thank you for your participation, and I ask that you please disconnect your lines. Thank you, and have a good day.